priestcraft. This is a topic that most of us don't think about very often, but is becoming a bigger and bigger issue in the world and in our church. One of the best known scriptures is Doctrine and Covenants 33 verse 3, which says, For behold, the field is white already to harvest, and it is the eleventh hour and the last time that I shall call laborers into my vineyard. But the scripture that follows in verse 4 is far less known and focuses on our topic today. It says, And my vineyard has become corrupted every whit, and there is none which doeth good, save it be a few. And they err in many instances because of priestcrafts, all having corrupt minds. For myself, I, I never imagined getting enough subscribers to ever worry about the question of monetization. After I got the first 1,000 subscribers, I had to make a decision whether I should monetize my YouTube channel or not. Ultimately, I decided to do it because my family and I wanted to give more help to those in need. So that is where the profits of this channel go. I say profits because there are costs associated with producing any content. For me, this includes several things, but one example I'll give you is that I pay my 12-year-old daughter to edit these videos. Now, don't tell her, but I don't do this because I need help editing the videos. I do it because by the time she is done editing one of these videos, she has watched it so many times that she has it completely memorized. How is that for a sneaky way to teach your kids the gospel? My other daughter, who is 10 years old, leads the charge in our family for the charity giving. Recently, she took her own money that she had earned and bought from Costco all of her favorite treats, which included applesauce packets, granola bars, Rice Krispie treats, fruit snacks, etc., and put them into individual lunch bags and dropped them off at a homeless shelter. Both girls have interest in doing good in the world, and so this YouTube channel for us becomes a great way to finance those efforts and bring us closer together as a family. I didn't start the channel with all that in mind, but I like how it has developed into that for us. Some people believe that simply getting paid to teach the gospel is priestcraft, but if that were the case, we wouldn't have any seminary teachers, institute teachers, or religion professors at college, so there must be more to this topic than just that. Nephi gives us the most succinct definition of priestcraft in 2 Nephi 26-29, which is the same definition which is used in the Guide to the Scriptures, where he says, He commandeth that there shall be no priestcrafts. For behold, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world, that they make it gain and praise of the world. But they seek not the welfare of Zion. So priestcraft is when someone seeks to become popular, so they can get rich, get a claim, and they don't care about Zion. Those practicing priestcraft first set themselves up for a light. How do they do this? One common method is to follow what Nehor did at the time of Alma. Quote, and he had gone about among the people, preaching to them that which he termed to be the word of God. So he preaches, stating that it is the word of God, but goes contrary to what the church teaches. It also says that he was bearing down against the church and also saying that the priests and teachers should become popular and be paid. Then it gives us this key, in my opinion, to priestcraft. It says, quote, He testified unto the people that all mankind should be saved at the last day. He told them what they wanted to hear. He taught popular ideas contrary to the gospel, but because people liked those, they wanted to hear more. It is easy to become popular if you are telling people what they want to hear. The word termed in verse 3 cross-references to Ezekiel 13. It is referring to those within the church that are teaching false and foolish doctrine. These men, referred to as prophets, were being reprimanded because they, quote, follow their own spirit and having seen nothing. He goes on to say, quote, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. Going back to Alma, he tells us what happened. And it came to pass that he did teach these things so much that many did believe on his words, even so many, that they began to support him and give him money. This leads to the final stage of priestcraft, which is listed in verse 6. And he began to be lifted up in the pride of his heart, and to wear very costly apparel, yea, and even began to establish a church after the manner of his preaching. So pride is clearly the underlying flaw. 
but it goes so far with people's praise and money that they break off and have their own church, which some people follow who like the doctrine that is being taught. So this is much more than just about being paid. On this very subject, Spencer W. Kimball, while a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, said, quote, I want our youth never to be taught by mercenaries. Should any of you be teaching in this program merely as an occupation, almost wholly for the compensation, then I hope you will be assigned to one of the other areas. But if your salary is incidental, and your grand and magnificent obsession is our children and their growth and development, then I hope you will be teaching in New York and Michigan and Wisconsin and Utah where my loved children are. See, it is about the intent of the teacher, which isn't as black and white as being paid or not for just teaching. For example, if I were being paid to teach that Yoda was actually modeled after Spencer W. Kimball, which is what I was taught as a child, then perhaps that is priestcraft. It is unfortunately only an urban legend and not true, but yet I want it to be true and others want to believe it. Paul Johnson, one of the 70, who was a great man, and I was fortunate enough to grow up in his ward, spoke at a church educational system conference in August of 2002 at Utah Valley State College. His talk was called The Dangers of Priestcraft, in which he had this to say, Can a person receive a salary in CES and not be involved in priestcraft? Yes, definitely. Can a person publish, get pay for continuing education, or take advantage of other opportunities and not be involved in priestcraft? Yes, they can. It is a matter of the heart. What is the motivation? What President Kimball said is a key in this area. When our hearts are set on money, it clouds our view and leads to bad decisions. The intention of the teacher of the gospel is also spoken of by Peter in 1 Peter 5, 2, where it says, quote, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Teachers shouldn't be forced to teach, and their motivation shouldn't be money. Many misinterpret this verse to mean that no one should get paid. But the way I read it, it is that our motivation shouldn't be the money. But it isn't about the money for many. The praise of the world can also be a huge factor. In that same CES talk, Paul Johnson also said this, quote, Some teachers have a strong desire for praise. In order to obtain that praise, they might begin to set themselves up as a light. When people look to them as a light, they are willing to give the praise they desire. This may increase their desire for more praise. And the cycle continues. It becomes dangerous because it can lead to teachers changing the doctrine or teaching things that shouldn't be taught or using teaching methods that shouldn't be used in order to appear as a light. Notice how the desire for praise is not only a vicious cycle but leads to the changing of doctrine, a key step towards priestcraft. He goes on to say we can receive a lot of commendation and a lot of praise if that becomes our goal or if we become intoxicated by it we begin to set ourselves up as a light. In 1992, Elder Dallin H. Oak said, Another illustration of a strength that can become our downfall concerns the charismatic teacher. With a trained mind and a skillful manner of presentation, a teacher can become unusually popular and effective in teaching. But Satan will try to use that strength to corrupt the teacher by encouraging him or her to gather a following of disciples. He went on to say, teachers who are most popular and therefore most effective have a special susceptibility to this form of priestcraft. If they are not careful, their strength can become their spiritual downfall. This brings us to an important point because these men were talking to trained professional teachers. What about the internet who has given a platform to the untrained? Platforms such as YouTube, other blog sites, Reddit forums, social media platforms, and many other internet sites make it easy for nearly anyone to gather a following and teach anything they want. In fact, these individuals are encouraged and rewarded for building a following of subscribers and followers on these platforms. The internet and all these platforms are the perfect gateway drug to priestcraft, 
whether someone is monetizing their work or not. Howard W. Hunter in 1989 gives a warning to teachers of the gospel saying, quote, that is why you have to invite your students into the scriptures themselves and not just give them your interpretation and presentation of them. You must invite your students directly to Christ, not just to one who teaches the doctrine, however ably. This is one of the many areas I can do better on as a teacher, but also as students, we need to be willing to dive into the scriptures ourselves and let the Spirit teach us, not just rely on the interpretation of those that are teaching us. What we should never be as teachers is the Pied Piper, and what we should never be as students are those that numbly follow after every sweet sound we hear. We must think and act for ourselves while we do the difficult work of trying to understand and grow in the gospel. Remember that you don't wake up one day practicing priestcraft. It is a slow downhill grade that changes us over time. Like most things, it is a dial, not a switch. From that great talk by Paul Johnson comes some early warning signs that we may be heading down the path of priestcraft so we can recognize and overcome them. First, we base our self-worth on praise from others for our lessons or talks. Number two, we begin to feel irreplaceable. Number three, people only want you to teach them and are resistant to be taught by others. Number four, feeling pride that people want you to teach them rather than others. Number five, the feeling that as a teacher, you are able to teach deeper doctrine than others. Number six, teaching our own opinions strongly or forcefully. Number seven, establishing yourself as the doctrinal expert in your ward or stake. Number eight, we get frustrated that others don't understand the gospel like you do. Number nine, inside edition syndrome where you or others feel like you are enlightened more than others. This can be felt by us or we can be in the wrong by making others feel this way. And these are just some of the signs. There are many others, especially if you are a teacher with in-class students. Many apostles and prophets have earned money through their efforts around publishing books or other materials without, I believe, having any priestcraft. This leads to another assumption on the part of outsiders about these current or past apostles, prophets, and other church leaders. Many assume that their prophets are used for their own personal gain. I personally am very grateful that these wise individuals spend their time to create this material so I can learn and progress myself. I don't know many of these individuals personally, but I know that some of them turn around and donate their profits to charities of various sorts, especially when they have the means where they don't have to live off of their earnings. But when it comes to priestcraft, the church has had to deal with people that go down the wrong path since the very beginning of the restoration. Some individuals course correct and do their best to stay in bounds, while others end up apostatizing and sometimes leading many others away with them. I think we all know examples of this, some from our very recent past. As you are taught by anyone in person or online, ask yourself, are they leading me closer to my Savior? This is probably a good litmus test for those you are learning from and if you can rely on them as a trusted source. But remember, ultimately, you should rely on the scriptures and the Spirit to teach you more than anyone else, especially on YouTube. Don't rely on any teachings where the source claims secret knowledge. Prophecy and revelation are always given within the bounds of that user's calling and stewardship. Outside of that, it is only their opinion, and we know that in the last days that many will be deceived and led astray. If you are a teacher in any physical or online capacity, from time to time, let's make sure, and I'm including myself in this, that we are staying within safe bounds because all of this, especially online, can be a very slippery slope. The focus should always be on our Savior, whether teaching or learning. Remember Moroni 7.13, Everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good and to love God and to serve Him is inspired of God. Also to be clear, I am no one of consequence. I don't hold any position of administrative significance in the church. These videos are just my opinion, and I hope people use them to come closer to the Savior. Never take my word for anything. Research yourself and come to your own conclusions. 
If I'm helping you study the scriptures more, then mission accomplished. Thanks for watching.